everyone. Welcome to one of your last garden videos of this school year. Can't believe it's gone so fast. So today I wanted to take the opportunity to celebrate spring as we're going in towards summer to talk about pollinators and how wonderful and important they are and to talk about things called pollination syndromes. Now, I've said a lot of things. Let's get to the very basics. So pollination, each plant Here's one. It's going to have pollen in it. And this pollen is going to be one of the main building blocks in making new plants via seeds. So what'll happen is a critter of some sort, be it a bird, a bee, a butterfly, an ant, will come across the pollen on one flower and either knowingly or most likely unknowingly, we'll get the pollen on them somehow. And then it'll move over to the next flower and it'll drop some of that pollen onto the next flower. And in doing so, moving that pollen from one flower to the next flower turns that pollen and other parts of the, within the flower into seeds. And sometimes even into fruit that we get to eat, which is really cool. So pollination, again, is that process of a critter coming in. Sometimes it's wind, but let's use critters today because that's what we're kind of going into. A critter of some sort coming in, moving pollen from one flower to the next. It's called pollination. Now, these critters that do pollination are called pollinators, which is so easy to remember. Pollination and pollinators, they move pollen. We love it. We love when it's so easy like that. The main pollinators that we have in the butterfly garden and the seven circle garden are things like hummingbirds, humming, I just hummingbirds, butterflies, um, sometimes other birds, but mostly just going to be hummingbirds. We get tons of bees, different kinds of bees, honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees. We get things like ants or ladybugs. Um, what else? Beetles of some sort sometimes can pollinate. And then at night we'll be getting things like moths. And I don't think we really have bats too much around here, but occasionally bats can also be pollinators. So each of these different types of pollinators, be it a bee, a bee or a bird or a hummingbird or a butterfly, are all going to be attracted to different kinds of flowers. Now a flower will do a couple of different things to say, hey, pollinators, come here, come pollinate my flower. Color will be a big indicator of what kind of pollinator will pollinate a flower. The smell will also be an indicator and the shape will be an indicator. So flowers that are more cone shaped or elongated at the bottom, you could think of it like if these were the petals, and this was the cone where it finally meets the rest of the plant. And I'll show you a couple in just a moment. Those are going to be more geared toward the pollinators like hummingbirds and butterflies. Because hummingbirds and butterflies have these long tongues or long proboscises that can reach down into the, the bottom part of that cone-shaped flower and get the nectar. Now the nectar is pretty much what these pollinators are going for. Now bees will sometimes also go for the pollen, but the reason why these critters want to go to the flowers is to get the nectar as a food source. And they just happen to bump into the pollen along the way. So the nectar is gonna be at the bottom of that, that tube or that cone-shaped flower, someone big and bumbly like a bumblebee is not going to be able to get down into that skinny little tube flower to get the nectar. So some someone or something um, designed for that, like a long nose of a hummingbird or a long nose of a butterfly are going to be perfectly suited for that. Butterflies and hummingbirds also tend to go towards the pinks and the oranges and the red flowers. Now you will see them on other color flowers for sure, but those are kind of what they're going to be geared towards when you see butterflies. So something like a milkweed, which attracts monarch butterflies, that's going to be in that orange and reddish and yellow family. And we've got some in the butterfly garden here. 
Now, if we're switching gears a little bit and going towards something like a bee, be it a carpenter bee, a bumblebee, or a honeybee, you're going to be seeing the flowers that they're going to be going towards are going to be generally in the blue, violet, pink family. So blues, purples, magentas, pinks. Now again, you will see them on yellow flowers. It's going to be a combination of both the color and the shape. If you see a blue flower that's a cone, most likely that bee won't be able to pollinate it. But if it's a yellow flower that's kind of a big, open, flat face, then the bee's gonna be able to more likely pollinate it. Essentially, that nectar and the pollen holders called the anthers on a flower need to be more readily available, need to be easier to access for a bee to pollinate it. So something like this nigella here, let's see if I can show you without pulling it out. Ooh. This nigella is a great example because it's a big flat place for the bee to land and its anthers are very readily available. Now critters like beetles and ladybugs and ants are not going to be as um, as specific when they're going out and pollinating. Their job isn't really like their main purpose isn't as a pollinator, they just are also pollinators, right? Whereas like a bee, his main purpose is a pollinator. And so it is looking for pollen. It, same thing with a butterfly. Her main purpose is gonna be a pollinator. She's looking for that nectar and also getting the pollen on her. So like uh, beetles and ladybugs and ants will pretty much go for anything as long if they're just crossing across a flower or crickets even you're you're they're still gonna pollinate though crickets do really love those um, those calla lilies those big white flowers with the yellow big yellow pollen um, anther in the center and you will definitely see a cricket in one of those Speaking of white flowers, moths are going to be attracted to white flowers because moths are attracted to light and white flowers reflect the light at both in both the daytime and in the nighttime. So moths can also pollinate during the nighttime, whereas bees and butterflies are generally not going to be pollinating at night. So they can't really see their flowers as much as well at night. So let me take you around the butterfly garden to show you some flowers that are going to be specifically pollinated by certain critters. Now again, this, this who is pollinating what is called pollination syndromes. So again, those hummingbirds and those butterflies are going to be pollinating those tubey shaped orange, red, pink family, whereas the bees are going to be pollinating a little bit wider flowers with purples, blues, magentas, and then the moths are going to go for the whites. So those, that idea or that study is called pollination syndromes. So let's go see if we can see what's going on in real life. First example are these gorgeous hollyhocks. They are big flowers. You can see them next to my hand. Big flowers compared to those tiny little yellow ones we were just sitting next to. And these have a big open face you can see easily can get to the pollen and a bumblebee could easily get in here, do its thing, get the pollen, get the nectar, and leave safely. So hollyhocks are the absolute favorite of the bumblebees. These coreopsis are also a great example of a wide open face of a flower where the bee generally can come in and pollinate. It's not gonna fall off. It's gonna be able to get the pollen and the nectar. Now, you might see hummingbirds or you might see uh, butterflies near the Coreopsis as well. So it's this kind of flower is one of those that a lot of different creatures can pollinate. Here's an example of a cone-shaped flower. You can see that it's going to take a long nose or a long tongue to reach the nectar, which is going to be down here. So a very small bee actually might be able to get into this kind. This is a uh, salvia. Oh, there's a bee now. 
but most likely this is going to be pollinated by something with a long nose or a long tongue. So this bumblebee is trying and so is that honeybee. It's going to be able to probably get the pollen here, but the nectar is going to be a little bit trickier for it to get. Now that little bee, that honeybee is actually fitting into this, which is great. Here is a penstemon and this is the perfect, perfect, perfect example of a hummingbird or butterfly pollinator plant. And you can see the, the nectar is going to be down here. It's very small, very tube-like. No critter is going to be able to get in here unless they've got a long nose. So you will not see bees buzzing around this guy. And you can see the difference in size from this. Look at how it is in my hand here versus how wide these are much wider. A honeybee could squeeze into there if it was small, but it's definitely not squeezing into here. It's also got that orange, yellow, red color that's perfect for those hummingbirds and butterflies. This is an echinacea or a cone flower, and you can see it's got a big open face, very easy to get into the pollen and the nectar here. This is a favorite of the bees. Very, very easy. Any big bee, like even a carpenter bee, could easily land on this and it would feel secure and definitely would get its food. Here's that milkweed I was talking about earlier and there is a bee on it back there. These honeybees are small enough that they really can pollinate nearly anything, but these are definitely also pretty tube shaped. So you're going to also see butterflies on this. This is planted to attract um, monarchs, but we also get ladybugs all over this guy. Now for a different reason. This one was infected with aphids last year as you guys probably saw in the video. And because it was infected with aphids and ladybugs eat aphids, we had a big ladybug colony on this plant. Now those ladybugs unknowingly pollinated this plant last year. like this pink yarrow is going to be another one that a lot of different pollinators will be able to access. So it's got this beautiful bright color that will attract lots of different critters, but it also is big and wide for easy landing for a large bee or bumblebee or even just a honeybee, but it can also be a nice place to land for butterflies because it's that color that they like and it does have small tubular flowers. Also these really tiny little bees. These are like the size of a tiny fly. They're not honeybees. I'm not sure exactly what they are, but they love the yarrow. They're the ultimate pollinator of the yarrow. This is a different color than the other. This is a light pink and the other was a dark pink. You can see it's little pollen sacs on its knees there, those bright yellow pollen sacs. I encourage you to go outside into the butterfly garden or the seven circles garden and try and hypothesize or make an educated guess on what kind of pollinator is going to pollinate certain kinds of flowers. And then maybe wait a while and see if you find that pollinator looking around that flower. Have fun. Here's our newest pollinator before I let you go. Cricket, come here. This is Cricket, everyone. She's our new garden dog. So if you haven't seen her around school, you will soon. She's a love bug. All right, bye.